Well, welcome back to the run-up on Plus TV Africa. Well, the Labour Party has accused the Independent National Electoral Commission of frustrating its petition against the outcome of the 2023 presidential election by not allowing it to inspect election materials as ordered by the appeal court. LP also raised the alarm that INEC had started reconfiguring the bimodal voter accreditation system without the presence of the representatives of political parties. Labour Party spokesman Dr. Yunusa Tanko accused INEC of disobeying the court order of the presidential election petition tribunal which directed it to grant the parties and its presidential candidate OB access to two certified copies of materials used in the conduct of the presidential poll. Tanko threatened that LP might ask its supporters to stage protests nationwide at the offices of the commission over its refusal to obey the court order. Well, joining us to discuss this is Aki Alawiye, public affairs analyst and member of the Labour Party. Aki, you're welcome to the run-up. I also have comrade Eragbe Aslam, national youth leader, Labour Party. Hello, comrade. Comrade Aslam, are you still with us? He's joining us online, <coughs> by phone or by Zoom. Do we have him? Thank you, I'm here. Very good. You're welcome to the program. We also have Mayoko Ilo, policy analyst and former governorship aspirant under the APC Ogun State. Gentlemen, you're welcome to the program. Thank you. All right. Not forgetting my virtual co host, Adebayo Aloreke. All right. Let me start by asking you. Uh, Mr. Aki Oloye, has the protest begun? We haven't kicked off the protest in earnest, uh, still giving INEC uh, and perhaps um, all of the other agencies involved supporting this process the opportunity to give us access uh, you know, to inspecting the Beavers devices. It's shameful uh, in this day and age that uh, a government agency will refuse the order of a court. Uh, just seeing that our democracy and all of the excellence we expect around the process should be protected. So again, uh, by end of the day, we will probably get some communic uh, across to all of our support groups. And um, I'm hoping we don't have to get to where we actually stage the protest because uh, it's just really sad that uh, a number of elements are looking to truncate a process that we think should be held sacred. All right, Ms. Ilo. After Labour Party got the court permission on the 3rd of March, INEC went to court on the 4th of March, asking the court to vary that order. And then they were granted permission to go ahead and, you know, reconfigure because they claimed that they needed five days to at least process it all before the governorship election. My question is, is INEC on track? Does the order they, they, they got supersede that which INEC had gotten on the 3rd? I know you're not a lawyer, but let's juggle this out. Well, I want to say, uh, in my opinion, uh, we should balance uh, legality with visibility. Uh, the elections were supposed to have held, at least for the governorship, on the 11th of this month. The reason it couldn't hold was not because INEC was not ready, but because of some legal tussle that made the thing not to have been able to happen within the uh, expected dates. So I wouldn't see this as a disobedience of a court order. I think the plan to protest is, uh, is hasty and not well conceived. Uh, I would say the right to protest is entrenched in democracies and civil societies worldwide. But we shouldn't uh, be using uh, tools whose time has not, which time has not come to address issues. Uh, INEC is saddled with the responsibility of conducting elections, the federal election and the state elections. It's in process. This is, is like drinking water from a fire hose now. So the fact that they have not complied between two weeks or one week ago does not mean that they are, disobedi they are disobedient to court orders. So there is need for patience, allow the process to play itself out. Because even the Labour Party is contesting in the election that is coming on Saturday. So there is really nothing on the table that suggests that, okay, if it doesn't happen before the 18th of, of March, then justice has not been served. I don't think that is the case. So there should be some patience on, uh, on all sides, because even though it is the Labour Party that is asking to inspect the beavers, 
all the parties would technically have to be present uh, in, in addition to INEC officials. INEC has a limited number of staff, which everybody knows. For the most part, 90% of the people they use during elections are ad hoc staff. So, and they are going to be busy configuring beavers for the next election and actually doing one or two other things. So, a little patience. I don't begrudge them for wanting to check the beavers, check the electoral document, but a little patience. All right. Yeah, what what we are understanding now is that INEC has already begun the process of reconfiguring without the representatives of the parties. And for Labour Party to say they want to go on strike, for me, means two things. That they want to inspect these machines before any form of reconfiguration. And two, that they do not trust that um, whatever they save in the server will not be doctored. Uh, this is where I'm going to call uh, the comrade. Comrade Anselm, please come in. Am I correct with my postulations? Uh, okay, Comrade Ragbe Aslam here, National Youth Leader, Labour Party. Well, it has become very obvious to us as Nigerians, even as observed by uh, the observers, local and international, with respect to what happened in Nigeria as it affected the presidential and national elections on the 25th of February 2023. Uh, by large, uh, what was expected ideally was a very free, fair and transparent process, uh, which have been issued had done otherwise. So we have instances where the results that came from the polling unit are from what we are seeing in, in the IRF portal and the way and manner in which uh, the results of the elections were collated and uh, declared. Now, particularly for us in the Labour Party, we are very worried and we have expressed that uh, displeasure. One, by going to the court uh, to demand that we be allowed to inspect. Yeah, we have moved no forward from that. Comrade Anselm, I'm saying because now Labour wants to protest. The reasons why you want to protest, even though you've gotten court injunction, a court order to go ahead and, you know, um, check these machines, uh, which INEC itself went to court the following day to get another order asking the court to vary. But you are going to protest today, as you have made us know, that's your party. And I'm saying, postulating, that the two major reasons why you want to protest is that you do not trust that whatever is going to be saved in the server, which INEC has been instructed to save, is not going to be doctored. And you also want to make sure that you witness or you do your inspection before the reconfiguration. Am I right? You are right. Because for us, like you said, it's an obvious fact. Ideally, let me say something. There is no basis really for reconfiguration of the beavers because uh, these are these are equipments that have large storage capacity. <laughs> now, ideally, just like your phone, the phone I'm using to speak with you now, I can save it's about 24 gigabytes of memory space I have just on this phone, and I'm I'm aware that the, the beavers have higher memory storage capacity. So I tell you, there's no basis for reconfiguration. It's such that all of this information could be stored side by side in different spaces within these systems. So the desire to even reconfigure the beavers, I mean, it's an abnormally in the four systems. So uh, that is because something is shoddy. But that which is shoddy is the reason we say, let us suspect, first and foremost, the beavers have the details. If you still choose Comrade Aslam. Okay, Adebayo, this is the time for you to come in and ask your questions. Please go ahead and do so. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I've been following the, uh, the responses of our guests, and I have a question for both of them. Um, that's um, uh, Akinolawe and uh, uh, Mayoku Ilo. And the question is this. Didn't INEC engage all the political parties before the elections began to explain to them how the beaver system works and what its capabilities are because now we are having all this um, suspicion 
which some have argued is reasonably justified, and then some confusion as to what exactly this beaver system is. So did INEC at any point before the elections engage with the political parties to say, we are going to be using this system, this is what it is capable of doing, this is what it is not capable of doing, these are the outcomes that we expect. Did that ever take place? So I'm very certain uh, the leadership of the Labour Party would have engaged INEC. Uh, equally, the public uh, expressed a lot of interest in you know, knowing how the Viva system works. Uh, a lot of Nigerians just seeing the excitement and the overwhelming uh, you know, participation at the polls uh, on the 25th could equally sit there at the polling unit and almost equally agree with the presiding officer on how and what to do with the Viva system. So where people you know, were challenging I next staff, you know, upload the results, use offline mode. So Nigerians are very intelligent. But then there's something I must say. Trust, but verify. Because we trust INEC to live up to his expectations does not mean we don't have to put INEC under a microscope. We're making sure we can verify that they are carrying out their fiduciary duty. Now, the other thing I want to explain is the fact that when we talk about resetting the devices or reconfiguring the devices, if you pull up to a petrol station to buy fuel in your car and somebody just bought gasoline what 2009 the first thing they would do is to crank it down have you look at it and say it's back to 0, 0.00 now you fill up your the full tank of your car and you bought 5,000 naira for only to find out that you perhaps have maybe 20 liters you're asking yourself where is the difference uh in gasoline i should have in my vehicle you can then say you know what i want to audit your systems with making sure i got what i paid for that is exactly what we are asking for Part of trusting the system is verifying that the system where we validate the data is protected and will not be altered. Looking at the logs is what we're simply asking for. And again, I, as an agency, have been given the mandate or the instruction by the court to allow the Labour Party to complete that process. So. Okay. Mr. Ailo, you want to add to that? Well, I, I will just say we are all on the same page here. We want, somebody said, uh, trust like uh, my friend here said but verify so even at that we should uh, allow the process to play itself out i can't hold forth for INEC. i know people have complained that maybe leading to the elections they haven't done enough in terms of sensitizing us in terms of telling us exactly how the beavers works but we cannot uh, postulate for the much that we don't know after the elections when everything has died down, it's another process entirely. In fact, there will be more court cases on account of the governorship elections that is coming than, than the presidential. So when that time comes, the lawyers will have a, had a, a field day to do their bits. Forensic analysts, forensic experts will be brought in. They, so more or less, there is nothing INEC does that will not be put under the microscope when the time comes. But now using the presidential to score to the governorship election is what I'm not up for at this stage. So we can be a bit patient, allow them. It's just five days or there about the way. Let the elections come. Then whatever it is that we feel INEC has done or has not done can be put under the microscope. All right. Um, we can just keep going back and forth on the issue of this INEC. And sadly, mm -hmm. we do not have them to answer some of the burning questions, which include knowing that litigation will always follow elections. Why not either do the governorship and the presidential same day or after the presidential announce or give enough time for the governorship, giving enough room for all the litigation, all the questioning, all the requests to inspect the machines as we now see playing out? And I think that's one of the questions I would love to ask INEC if I had the opportunity. But let's talk about, let's talk about the protests that uh, Labour has planned to get involved in. What scope is it going to take? So when we're talking about protest, uh, I think, again, in Nigeria, we've made that word, you know, uh, coin it to a very negative term. It's enshrining the Constitution, the right to protest, the right to freedom of assembly peacefully, and the right to association. Uh, so talking about protests across INEC offices, it's just basically calling Nigerians, again, good citizens, peace-loving people, to come out and express their displeasure with the system. And I think it's unfair to say that INEC is understaffed or INEC perhaps, you know, uh, you know, is allowed to be inefficient 
Main fully water, INEC is a well-funded government agency. Agency that had four years to prepare for election that hold on two days. So again, um, to have my APC colleague here sit down and promote inefficiency, incompetency as a way of governance, I think we are saying no, we're rejecting it. And yes, indeed, when we have the flag up that we will be allowed to, again, as part of support from political party, uh, Labour Party, my party, go out to INEC offices, it will be peaceful, there will be no destruction, there will not be any types of um, mayhem or chaos. And I think there are a lot of INEC employees that will equally agree with you that a lot of what they've seen and have been asked to carry out as part of their functions is not, you know, uh, in accordance with the law. So for every Nigerian out there, I would ask people to be vigilant. Uh, again, don't be frustrated because what you're seeing is the establishment, the APC, looking for ways to promote this, what I call energy of apathy, where Nigerians become docile, we don't care about elections, and we just, again, it didn't work out to so move on with life, go with your business. We're saying no. We don't want to have to end up in court or with multiple litigations. Get it right so we don't have to have people bogged down for the next three, four months waiting for outcomes across judge, uh, courtrooms. Is, it, is this going to be across the country? This yes, nationwide, correct. Do you not nurse the fear that this protest, even though you have called for a peaceful protest, could be hijacked? So I think when, we, when that reference is equally made, then perhaps the government or the security forces should understand that we pay taxes and we expect them to carry out their functions. So if named individuals with faces like me show up to protest, I'm not going to protest to then have a street urchin or a thug sponsored by, again, nefarious elements in society show up and hijack the process if the police, if the military, if the DSS are all up on their game. So no, we don't expect it to be hijacked. Okay, let me talk to the youth leader, Comrade Anslam. Comrade Anslam. Okay, we, we, we've, we've lost connection with him, but he's going to obviously come back. But let me throw this question to you. One of the concerns that people had when the 25th February election uh, was received with mixed feelings, the youths were highly aggrieved. One of the questions I asked at some point is, is there any fear that the youth could get angry to the point that we see a repeat of NSARS? And fortunately, we didn't see that. Do you find that instructive? Let me start with you, Mr. Ilo. Do you find that instructive that the youth this time were calm and matured in their outcry against what they saw as injustice? Well, I think... Uh a part of that will be the demeno, the majority of uh, maybe the political leaders. PDP has has done some protests in Abuja. They might not have the the youth power or favor that uh, maybe a Mr. Obi commands, but it's been peaceful. Uh, peaceful protests are a part of the norm in all civilized democracies, which Nigeria is aspiring to be one. Uh, but that said, I still think uh, this one is a bit premature. Uh, we have time on our hands. Election is uh, and election litigations are actually marathons. They are not sprints. It's not, you know, the way obedience sometimes carry the issue of elections is as if within the next two months, within the next one month, within the next two weeks, uh, the courts will, on the basis of uh, maybe protest, or on the basis of beavers, Overturn, overturn an election. No, this issue is going all the way to the Supreme Court. And at the end of the day, it is how you are able to prove your case. I knew ahead of time as an EPC member that, okay, it's going to be difficult for a Peter Obi to win because of some things, permutations and combinations that have been done here and there. Elections are not won on the basis of social media alone. But that said, I respect the movement, I respect the energy, I respect even the changes that his candidacy has brought, you know, because there has been a lot of complacency on maybe on the on the normal the way politics has been done in Nigeria. He came in, he changed a bit of that. Now using that element of change, that energy to bring about change at the national level and maybe take over the presidency is another ball game entirely. I won't say it's not impossible, but maybe not with the energy that we have now, maybe with the permutations and combinations. Presidency in Nigeria has always been by, at least in politics, has been by alliances. He has not gotten that level of alliance. You know, people will tell you the youth is everything, but no, 
there are thought makers, there are opinion leaders, there are entrenched career politicians that all they think about is to think about the next three, four, five steps in politics and how they are going to marshal resources, marshal people, get people on their side. You understand? And Atiku made a mistake of maybe allowing some five governors to go away. He paid dearly for it. Mm. Obi made the mistake of not building enough, maybe time wasn't on his side, building enough handshake across the Niger into the heartland of the north. You know, a Kano state is not Kano city alone. Uh, Jigawa is not Adamawa, you know, and all the rest of it. So, but there are lessons to be learned. My issue with him over time, I'm a young person, sometimes you like a young person to be in power, but he has not had the time. And the time he had over the last almost 10 years that he has left public office, he has not used it to build the bridge that he will use to climb to the presidency. It's never too late. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is mm -hmm. now. Timubu has been a bridge maker, has been a godfather kind of person over the years. I'm not saying it in negative, negative light, but if you don't control the people, if you don't uh, lead, as it were, the people that you can use to climb, they will not be there for you when you need them. Now, Peter Obi is meeting with the senators elect under the Labour Party uh, candidacy. He's meeting with the House of Reps. He's meeting with governors. He's campaigning with them. So that is telling him a message that, okay, if in the next four years I'm going to stand the chance of being a force to reckon with, then definitely I will need these people. If he's not careful, you'll be surprised that these Labour people in Senate Half of them will join APC in the next four years. That's the kind of political leader that Enobu is. So if you are not careful enough to know that, okay, you have to stand your ground and use ideologies and use strengths, you know, and use maybe good leadership to bring them into your fold and keep them there, you'll be surprised that they will find a better house in, uh, in APC than even Okay, a lawyer. You're shaking your head. Yes, yes. Um, I, and, and I think that's where the political establishment uh, did not read the writing on the wall ahead of the 25th. Uh, elections. There is a new direction we're taking <clears throat> as a nation politically. Perhaps Peter Obi may have been that person that again was able to drum up the energy that you've seen. But let me paint a picture. Every generation writes its rules. The politics of Awolowo, the politics of Shagari, the politics of Bola Metinubu is not the politics that my generation chooses to play by. And I say this because again, a party, Labour Party, in seven months, no structure, social media noise. They will not get more than four local government areas. Four people tweeting in a room cannot even get 5% in Lagos. We beat APC in its stronghold. You're looking at incursions we made in the north, into Nasarawa, into Plateau, and you're seeing new, again, first-timers in politics, never one councillor, never even went actively for party meetings, emerged as federal House of Rep members. I use Etiosa. My background, which we call Sorosoke constituency, perhaps looking at the energy from the NSAS protest. The House of Wealth member there, Atta Chief, I will say this on record, perhaps did not have Peter or this phone number in his contact list the day before elections. So guess what? The people, young people like me, a lot of housewives in Lekki Phase 1, in VGC, in different parts of this local government said, we will promote this candidate. Perhaps if posters in Lagos won elections, APC would win every single seat across the state. But what did you find? Every day, ordinary Nigerians showing up to the polls and said, we've had enough. We will rewrite the rules of the future. We will change the blueprint of politics. Yeah, you talk about politics of alliance and how you have to cross the Niger. Perhaps we're saying for once the message, the character, the individual running for office, not all of the patronage and deals People would often make politically across regions we saying, I will promise you plush contracts or oil blocks. We are saying, no, give us people that would show up and do the bidding of the Nigerian citizen, make this country proud, make this country great again. So perhaps this, let me call it APC, PDP ideology that politics is done off of the back of deals. We have written it away. 41 plus House of Rep members, nobody saw us even winning one seat. It tells you something that Nigerians for once are taking charge of the future. So if you want to make this argument that, again, the architecture of politics lies in Ghana must go, you know, using the local structures of ballets or igwe's or, you know, sheikhs across the nation to control communities, people are independent-minded, and Nigerians have proven that the way they will vote in France, the way they vote in the USA, the way they vote in Sweden, we can equally be in the same. And that old politics 
for me, I can say we should start wishing it away. We've been taking a look at the plant protest by the Labour Party. And uh, with me, I have Aki Oloye, public affairs analyst and member of the Labour Party. We have Comrade Iragbe Anslem, national youth leader of the Labour Party, who's joined us virtually. And uh, Maya Quilo, policy analyst and former governorship aspirant under the APC in Ogun State. Gentlemen, it's good to still have you with me. And uh, not forgetting Adebayo Aloake, my virtual co-host. Adebayo, you're still there? Um, yes. All right, so before we went on that short break, uh, Mr. Ilo, you wanted to respond to what Mr. Olawaye was saying with regards to the way politics used to be and how it's evolving. Yeah, uh, well, uh, some people said this way, the, the more things change, the more they remain the same, you know. At the end of the day, it will still be about uh, alliances and uh, know your, what they call know your neighbor in politics, you know. Sometimes my decision on who to vote for is predicated on the, what I hear from, from my neighbors about this particular person. The person representing me in Lagos here, my, the state assembly, came around yesterday. You know, people have some misgivings about him. But at the end of the day, people spoke and we couldn't even know half of what he has done before. But when he came and explained himself and did some stuff, like, okay, you did this, but you have not done enough to market yourself. People have found, you know, felt you have been distant. So this was like a payback time. But thank goodness he came in the nick of time and he said, no, I've not been hiding. This is me. Forgive me if I've not been able to market myself. Well, and as at the last count, 70% of the residents in my community said he deserves to go back into the house. So if tomorrow you don't see Labour Party sweeping Lagos, it's because at the end of the day, it might be a bit late because some people have been saying, ah, the governor is now everywhere in Lagos. You've seen him in church. In fact, it became a bit ridiculous at some point, but he is fighting for his political life. You have to take that, give that to him. So if you see him in church, it's better so that when Saturday comes and Monday comes and he's pronounced the winner, which I know it will be, <laughs> on the account of people voting for him, you understand? It's not everybody that has the same energy of uh, being a, a media person, you understand? But at the end of the day, results should speak. Lagos can do maybe better, but being better is not because those who are there are not trying. It's because maybe they've not been getting the best advice or they, they don't have enough opposition. I would like, at least for the record, Labour Party to win a few seats and put some pressure on the Lagos State House of Assembly. Let each governor that comes into office know that, okay, this is about serving the people. This is about giving uh, account of stewardship. Why is Fashola a most beloved governor, you know, in Lagos? It was because every 100 days he will come and address the people and say, okay, over the last 100 days, these are what we have achieved. It's the same Lagos, it belongs to all of us, even though it's a Yoruba land. People have come, have settled, people have, you know, everybody has found out that, okay, Lagos is, is the best state to live in in Nigeria, despite the notion of, okay, it's the worst city in the world and stuff like that. Yet, we love our Lagos. We enjoy the communities. It's, we can sleep with our two eyes open, even more than, I'd rather live in Lagos than live in Abuja. So, it didn't come overnight. It's not because uh, God has bestowed on us the right to live peacefully. It's because the government, you know, in charge of the state, they are doing their best to make sure, okay, how can we make sure that the people, the residents are at peace and live in, with a secure environment and live with their two eyes closed? All right. Now, because we have another topic to take a look at, I want us to look at this very particular issue that I think is very crucial. Because irrespective of your party, PDP, Labour Party, APC, Nigeria is the subject. And democracy is crucial to our growth. Now, this issue of disregard for court rulings and judgments at the risk of making the judiciary a limb dog, the Supreme Court a limb dog. How do you see that? So I think uh, I, I call it um, rascality and impunity uh, of, you know, government agencies choosing to, you know, they, they basically cherry pick, you know, rulings that they respond to. And it's dangerous for any democracy. The court should be the last destination for resort, of resort for the common man. And when you see political candidates 
like Peter Obi in my Labour Party, or others saying, hey, we're seeking redress in court. The court, again, perhaps uh, issues an order to the agency, and the agency overlooks it and begins, again, configuring the devices or planning for next Saturday's elections without, again, doing their due diligence. It's troubling. I mean, what does this, what message does this send to investors looking at Nigeria as a destination, you know, to bring FDI? What does this say to the average nine-year-old girl or boy that has been taught in civics classes that go to court, get a judgment, and perhaps that's how society should be put in alignment? And it's troubling that we would always only wait till Nigerians throw their hands up. There's some form of, again, perhaps, uh, you know, let me call it civil response before the, before this agency say, okay, you know what, we're going to do the right thing. You reference NSARS, calling for the 5 for 5 where we wanted increased salaries for police officers, uh, mental evaluation, prosecuting those found wanting for crimes uh, against citizens. And it took young Nigerians, even old across every social demography, saying, you know what, we want change. And I think it doesn't have to escalate to that point for us to say, you know what, we can get it right. I mean, INEC has a lot of professionals, individuals. The qualification to be an INEC employee is a BSU and HND, if I last checked. And a lot of people that work there have even worked for agencies across the world. So what stops us from having a competent, efficient system that delivers good elections so we don't even have to go to court? It's only Nigeria that people tell you, oh, when you run for office, prepare half of the money you're going to need for campaign for the courtrooms. Why? Let's get away from that type of politics because it does not make our democracy get any mature. Mr. Ilo. Well, uh, the evil men do live with them. If, if you're having issues today, it's, it's not something that happened over the last four or eight years. It's the foundation of democracy that has been set from 1999. Uh, Shiva Basanjo is a respectable, respected statesman, as it were. But when he was leaving office, he didn't bequeath us with a, a democratic transition that was uh, maybe the toast, the sign show of all eyes at the time. That foundation was faulty. It was, at the time, if you recollect, his second in command in office was a certain uh, Alaji Atiku Abubakar. So that same on, on equal imperfect system that they navigated at the time and they didn't improve on. So it actually took a certain Muhammad Buhari to come in and make expressions. We are apathetic people. I've said it uh, at an earlier forum. Nigerians don't really care. Everybody talks of the need for change. But when the push comes to shove, people, youths play football on that day. How in a country of 200 million people where the, the midline of our population is 18 years. That means technically 100 million Nigerians are above 18. 100 are below. So we should be having registered voters, 93 million, close to that figure that we are looking at. But at the end of the day, we are having 25 million people voting. How do we explain that to the generations yet unborn? So whoever wins, maybe as pronounced by INEC or as judged by the courts, at the end of the day, is running with a weak mandate. But that said, a mandate, a weak mandate is better than no mandate. We don't want to throw the country into anarchy. Let whoever is disgruntled or whoever feels that some processes have not been followed go to court. We, we can't preempt the courts. You know? That is where, while you can use the uh, protest to spice up things a bit, we should also know that at the end of the day, it is the court that will decide they will not necessarily decide in our favor. I can go back in time, I can look at 1979 elections, I can look at 1993 elections, I can look at some other elections over time. Even the Buhari that is about stepping down from office, on each of the occasions in which he lost elections, he, he didn't disagree. He never congratulated the winner of those elections. He went to the Supreme Court, until the Supreme Court said no, the other person actually won. So if uh, Peter Obi, feels he has been robbed or, or the processes have not been followed, it is up to the courts to decide. The election, the, the one we are talking about now, was a judgment of the appeal court. Is mm -hmm. this is not uh, at par 
with CBN and federal government disobeying Supreme Court order. When it gets to the Supreme Court, that is where you know, okay, now you are disobeying the court. Because if we, for every judgment that has not gone as high as it could, begin to change status quo, unless where necessary, then we have a problem. Imagine Osho states now, the tribunal, two against one, some people will say it's one versus one, said the current governor, the incumbent governor, the PDP governor, mm -hmm. is not supposed to be in office. So do we now push him out of office while he's on appeal and say, no, let, uh, let the APC or Yetola come back? Then the appeal court will now say, no, it's actually supposed to be Yetola. Then we come back and he's sworn in into office again. So we should avoid this dilly-dallying and uh, a process that is not uh, well completed. So I will still advise, while I don't see anything wrong with protest, the protest should not be channeled against INEC. You can do a protest, federal government do the needful put INEC into office. Imagine what will happen if we say, okay, CBN is not doing the needful. Let's target CBN office nationwide. The last time people tried it, I think some people died. All right. Well, this is a good place to end this subject. Uh, we've been taking a look at the plant protest by the Labour Party, and we've had Aki Olaoye, Public Affairs Analyst, member of the Labour Party, Comrade Iragbe Anslam, National Youth Leader, Labour Party, and Maya Quilo, policy analyst and former governorship aspirant under the APC in Ogun State. We take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be taking a look at some of the crises rocking the APC, especially with the call for the resignation of its chairman. Stay with us.